and we will begin. All right, I wanted to say again, welcome, you know, um, truly he is alive. That's why we sing hallelujah. Death there has no more sting, you know. So we are grateful for Jesus Christ who has resurrected, who has died, was crucified and was resurrected for each and every one of us. Um, let me pull up the study today's we're going to continue today in the study entitled the essence of time um, so far for those of you who might have missed any parts we have been studying the final events of earth's history uh, just before the second coming of Christ we have seen that there are only a few prophecies remaining to be fulfilled and I'm not going to go into all of those at this time but if you missed any of the previous presentations on this topic, you can access them on my YouTube page. It's uh, entitled Pablo Pacheco Jr. You can look that up uh, in YouTube and you can find any of the previous studies on the essence of time. But before we get into it, we're going to have a word of prayer and we're going to ask the Holy Spirit to be our guide, our teacher. Again, welcome to this study. And I pray that each and every one of us will be blessed. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I want to thank you so much, dear God, for this opportunity once again to continue to study your word and to continue to look at the final events just before the coming of Jesus Christ. Lord, we look into these things so that we can be ready and so that we can be aware of what's coming. You told us in Amos 3, 7, you reveal your secrets to your servants. And so, dear Father... We come to you to reveal to us everything that we need to know so that we can be prepared. We pray that the truth will have a power as described in John 17, 17, that it will work to sanctify us, dear God. So we pray that your Holy Spirit will come into every one of us that is listening to this study. I pray especially that you will come into me, that you'll use me as your mouthpiece. I pray that your angels will surround each and every one of us to keep every bit of distraction away from us, dear Lord. And I pray, dear God, that these studies will bind our hearts to Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who has risen and is glorified forever and ever and ever again. Dear Lord, we thank you and we praise you. We dedicate this time to you. And we ask all of these mercies in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. All right, brethren. So, again, we're looking at the essence of time. Now, just to give you a quick overview, because uh, we've been in, uh, you know, we came back. Uh, I mean, we were, we, we, I was out for one week, but I want to just give you a little overview a view of what happened last week. Last week, we looked at uh, how the image of the beast, as described in Revelation chapter 13 and verse 14, has already been formed to some degree and how it is getting ready to speak um, we also saw that when it speaks it will speak as a dragon meaning that it will implement draconian unconstitutional laws we here in America are already feeling the breath actually of the dragon's voice speaking draconian laws are even now in place but soon and very soon, we will hear the dragon speak in words that seek to usurp an authority that belongs only to God. He will exercise all the power of the first beast before him, and he will cause the earth and them which dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed, according to Revelation chapter 13 and verse 12. Now, this may seem impossible to most people but prophecy we're told is a more sure word it will happen last week we saw that not only is it possible but that the government of the United States is already showing signs that makes this point clearly evident the president has already signed an executive order making it possible 
for the church to influence the state. Paula White, the president's personal pastor, an evangelical Christian pastor, has joined the White House as the president's personal overseer of groups of co and coalitions. And she is working to oversee these groups and coalitions that are a key part of the president's base. This development and fulfillment of Bible prophecy reinforces the validity, validity of the scriptures to those who may have hitherto been skeptics. This is why we, we know that the Bible is a more sure word of prophecy given, us, given to us so that we can take heed to it and benefit from it. Now, we also saw that what is really going on in this world is a war against the commandments of God. We saw that the powers of earth will eventually unite and join this war. There will be a decree which will intend to force all people to conform to the customs of the apostate church by the observance of a false or the false Sabbath. And finally, we saw that all who refuse to go along with this heretical decree will be visited with civil penalties and even threatened with death. Now, we know, just before we even continue, we know that the Sabbath Sunday issue is just something that indicates a deeper issue. When the Sunday law is enforced in this country, we know that, that that's when the mark of the beast will be begin to form in everybody's mind. Because the faith that we are developing now is what's going to lead us to a point where we can stand for Christ even when our life is threatened. We will be now developing a character that includes rest. A character of restfulness. That's really what the Sabbath represents. It is, it, is, it is getting to a place in our Christian walk where we learn to trust God and love Him to such a degree that we live in a state of restfulness regardless of what situations we go through, regardless of what the enemy throws at us. To receive the mark of the beast, even though Sunday worship at that time when the government seeks to impose and force people to keep this blue law, the real issue uh, in regard to the mark of the beast is the opposite of the character development of those who, who, who have developed the character of restfulness. They will, be in, they will have developed a character of unrestfulness. A character where they don't have rest, day or night. Why? Because they've wasted their time or disbelieved God's word or clung to some cherished idol which has prevented them from developing the trust and love and relationship with Jesus Christ that they would have had the opportunity to do, to do so. So they have not been able to develop a character of restfulness but instead have a, a character which uh, ha has no rest. It's, a, it's, a, it's an anxious character, it's a fearful character, it's a character of selfishness uh, and every other trait of character that that is actually uh, comparable to the brute beast type of character. That's why it's called the mark of the beast, meaning the character of, the, of a brute beast, that type of character. I'm going to uh, do something for a minute here because I hear uh, somebody's mic, so I just, I'm just muting everyone. All right, so let's keep our uh, mics on mute as we get into, go, continue going through this presentation so that nobody gets distracted. All right, so now, Inspiration tells us the following. In Review and Herald, January 1st, 1889, paragraph 4. 
It says prophecy represents Protestantism, Protestantism as having lamb-like horns, but speaking like a dragon. Now that's very critical for us to understand, because many times we look at America as being this uh, lamb-like beast, uh, but in reality, it gets to a place. America. It, it begins as America, but it gets to a place where America now is controlled by the church. It, so it becomes, this is why it becomes an image to the beast, which is the first beast of Revelation chapter 13, verses 1 to 10, which describes the papacy or the Vatican type system of church and state. The, this country will, will, will become the same type of, uh, of, of entity. It will be a church state country, a government or power. So, prophecy represents Protestantism as having lamb-like horns, but speaking like a dragon. So it would be Protestantism controlling this country. It continues to say, it says, Already we are beginning to hear the voice of the dragon. There is a satanic force propelling the Sunday movement, but it is concealed. Even the men who are engaged in the work are themselves blinded to the results which will follow their movement. Think about that. Even the men who are engaged in this work are themselves blinded to the results which will follow their movement. Why? Because they've been lied to and deceived by the enemy because they have not looked at the more sure word of prophecy. They have not studied the word. They thought that it was you know, a, 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 a good book or maybe even a uh, uh, a book just written by men. It was a fairy tale book. They didn't take it seriously. And now they're going to realize that everything that was written in the prophecies, everything that was written in that book, will actually come to pass. So even the men who are engaged in the work are themselves blinded to the result which will follow their movement. Another thing that blinds men is sin. Sin blinds the eyes of people. This is why we say, how can Satan even... Uh, try to promote the Sunday law if he knows that's going to end the, the great controversy because he himself is fixed in sin. And so to a certain degree, he himself is self-deceived even though he knows the word of God more than many of us. Now many think themselves as enlightened to the reality of current events. They believe that they are rich and increased with goods and in need of nothing more. But sadly, they are blind. You see, who are those that are going to be pushing these things? The church or the churches. Last week we saw that uh, in, 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 in uh, reference to Isaiah chapter, the prophecy of Isaiah chapter 4, verse 1, where it says, Seven women grab a hold of one man and say, Let us eat our own bread and drink our own, and let us wear our own apparel. Let us only be called by thy name to take away our reproach. That's a prophecy that is being fulfilled and will be fulfilled and is being fulfilled actually in our time. Seven women representing all of the mainstream churches. And it's these apostate Protestant churches, all of the mainstream apostate Protestant churches that are, go are going to be pushing these movements. But they are blind. Why? Because they believe they're rich and increased with goods and in need of nothing. They don't see the issues, nor the results which will follow their own movements. God's true remnant will not be in the dark. Why? Because they have followed the true light bearer, Jesus Christ. The issues are plain as the noonday to them. God is giving us this light at this time of earth's history, brethren, so that we do not stumble while being exposed to light. You see, He's given us light, but we need to not only get this intellectually, we need to accept it into our hearts and our souls because the light has a name. His name is Jesus Christ. So let us not stumble while exposed to the light. Let us not allow ourselves to be eventually marked or branded as property of the beast.
Great Controversy, page 604, paragraph 3, also commenting on Revelation 14, 9, 9 and 10. It says, With the issues thus clearly brought before him, whoever shall trample upon God's law to obey a human enactment receives the mark of the beast. He accepts the sign of allegiance to the power which he chooses to obey instead of God. The warning from heaven is, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. Now, for those of us that don't understand the wrath of God, you can go on to my YouTube page and watch a presentation entitled, The Wrath of the Lamb, which, uh, if you prayerfully study that, uh, and look at it, you, you, you get a good idea. And also, you can also study Romans chapter 1, verses 18 to 28. But what this really means is that whoever allows himself to reject the salvation that was already wrought out by Christ, the second death will be the cup of his portion, unfortunately. But God is asking us today, why choose to drink the cup of wrath? when we have been given the option of drinking the cup of eternal salvation. You see, we don't want to do like Esau and give up our eternal inheritance for a bowl of soup. Now, many will be deceived by their ministers. Ministers will use scripture out of context when the Sunday law goes into full effect. And I say full effect because... Sunday laws are actually on the books right now. They are termed blue laws. You can look this up yourself. They're termed blue laws. Although they are on the books, they are currently enforced upon certain businesses and they regulate certain activities. But soon, they're actually going to enforce an apostate form of worship in accordance with Bible prophecy. Now, in these last days, you will begin to hear more and more ministers pointing you to Romans chapter 13, verses 1 to 7. We're going to read that, by the way, so that we will not be caught off guard when we hear the ministers using Romans chapter 13, verses 1 to 7, out of context. So let's read Romans chapter 13, verses 1 to 7, because we need to know what the Bible says. The Bible says... Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. For there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God. And they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Will thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. For he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that does evil. Wherefore ye must needs be subject, not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. For, for this cause pay ye tribute also. For they are God's ministers, attending continually upon this very thing. Render therefore to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Now, I underlined a few things in, this, uh, uh, in this, uh, these few verses. I underlined the word higher powers says, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. Then where it says, there's no power but of God. So there's no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. So higher powers of God, ordained of God. Talking about these powers, it says, he beareth not the sword in vain. So he bears a sword. But he doesn't bear the sword in vain. This, these higher powers that are ordained of God. It says he. Notice it uses the masculine singularity. 
He is the minister of God. It says, For he beareth not the sword in vain, for he, singular, masculine, is the minister of God. For what? Conscience sake. Conscience sake. And he's called God's minister, or God's ministers. Now, interesting. This scripture, brethren, must be understood in the proper context. And you know what? We have not understood this, I don't believe, probably for many, many years. We have misunderstood this scripture. Because what God revealed to me during my studies in preparation for this study is probably something that you probably never heard before. Now notice, this scripture applies to the, and, and it uses the term higher power. But it applies the term higher power primarily to God's word. God's word. And not to governments as we are most commonly taught. In a secondary sense, it applies to God's church. I'm going to repeat that again. Because we've been taught that this, these verses apply to the governments. To the powers that be. Now I'm going to ask you to put your phones on mute again when you join. I know that uh, most of you are on mute. I guess somebody must have just joined. I right, thank you for putting your phone on mute. Thank you very much. All right, let's continue. Again, we're looking at Romans. Looking at Romans chapter 13, verses 1 to 7. And why are we looking at this for that person who just joined? We're looking at this because we're looking at this, the signs of the times that, that are going to happen, the things that are going to happen, actually, the events, the prophetic events that are going to take place just before the coming of Christ. And one of the events is that we're going to hear more and more ministers using Romans chapter 13 verses 1 to 7 and apply th those verses to the to the governments and the laws of the land and and it's going to say that those are the higher powers and that's what we've been taught this is what I have always understood until I did this study now I'm going to I'm going to say something that might shock the person who just came on this scripture applies the term higher powers primarily to God's word and not to governments as we are most commonly taught. In a secondary sense, it applies to God's church. So primarily, it applies to God's word. Secondarily, it applies to God's church. That's something that you probably never heard before. And I'm going to show you how. In the scriptures, the word ministers... The word ministers, as we saw in these verses, 1 to 7, Romans 13, the word minister in the scriptures is used 24 times. I went back and looked at this word minister because it said these are the higher powers and they are God's minister or ministers. In the scriptures, the word ministers is found, I mean, sorry, the word ministers, plural, is used 24 times. The word minister, singular, is found 98 times. Almost each time it refers to God's priests. In only two or three instances is it used to describe goodwill or blessings. But not once is it used to describe a secular power or a secular authority. Not once. The kings of this world or powers of this world are not the ones ordained of God. His people are. I'm going to prove this a little further as we continue. In Acts chapter 10 verse 42, Luke gives us the true meaning of the power that is ordained of God. Remember, Romans 13 talks about, verses 1 to 7 talks about the powers that are ordained of God. So Acts chapter 10 and verse 42 Luke gives us the true meaning of this term, the power that is ordained of God. Notice what it says in Acts chapter 10, verse 42. And he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he, speaking of Christ, it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of quick and the dead. Wow. It is he. 
Notice if you go back to Romans 1, it uses the term he singularly, masculinely, in a masculine way. It's talking about Christ. Inspiration describes the higher powers as God's word, Jesus Christ. Notice here in manuscript 65, 19, 12, paragraph 39, also quoting Romans chapter 13, verses 1 and 2. It says, The churches of today have become converted to the customs and practices of the world. No longer are they the peculiar holy people who are rep representatives of Jesus Christ. Said the apostle, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. For there is no power but of God. And the powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God. And they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. Notice there, it's talking about The, it says the churches have become uh, uh, corrupted. They've been converted to the customs and practices of the world. It says the churches of today. Right? But it, then it says, and it says that no longer are they, the churches of today, peculiar holy people or representatives of Jesus Christ. But then the scripture says, let every, every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Now, ministers, brethren, and all others who are connected with the church of God, she goes on to say, obey this injunction. Notice what she says here. Ministers and all others who are connected with the church of God should obey this injunction, for if they do not obey God's word, if they do not present their bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is their reasonable service, although their names may be registered on the church books, they are not written in the Lamb's book of life. Now, she's saying, ministers and all others are, that are connected with the church should obey this injunction for if they do not obey God's word. God's word. Is she saying that these things are talking about secular powers? Or is she saying it's talking about God's word? Remember, if you go back, it talks about the sword. It yields a sword. What does a sword represent? It represents God's word. So if we go back to Romans chapter 7 for a minute. Look at it for a second. Romans chapter 13, verses 1 to 7, talking about the higher powers of God, ordained of God. And then it goes down, when you go a little further, He, goes, it, now, it, 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 it now turns it into a singularity and masculine. He bears not the sword in vain. Who's the one that bears the sword? Jesus does. Because Jesus is the Word of God. For He is the minister of God. And when you go back and look at the word ministers, again, it talks about God's priests and who is God's, who is the high, who's our high priest? Jesus Christ. So the higher powers, brethren, are not the secular powers. They, it is Jesus Christ and those that rep represent Jesus Christ on the earth. And it is Jesus Christ that deals with conscience, not the secular powers. The secular powers deal with civil things having to do with civil law, not moral issues dealing with the conscience. So the powers, the higher powers, brethren, is Jesus Christ and His church. Now, Yes, there are secular powers all around us, and yes, we should obey the laws of the land. So I'm not, don't, please do not misquote me as saying that we don't obey the laws of the land. There are secular powers all around us, and yes, we should obey the laws of the land. But what is the higher power spoken of in Revelation 13, I mean in Romans 13? Or what is the highest power? Who holds the highest courts? What are the greatest laws? What do we do when there is a conflict in this arena between the higher powers and the lesser powers, the powers of the earth? Because if you want to talk about secular powers, brethren, they are not higher in any case at all. They are the lesser powers. The higher powers come from heaven. The lower powers are on earth. But sometimes they're going to come in conflict. At this time of earth's history, they're going to come in conflict. 
And what do we do in this arena when this happens? We determine to follow the laws of God above the laws of men. Testimonies, Volume 5, page 712, paragraph 3 says, There is a prospect before us of a continued struggle at the risk of imprisonment, loss of property, and even of life itself to defend the law of God, which is made void by the laws of men. Anything that comes from man is not a higher power, it's a lower power, especially secular, ungodly men. Notice here, in this situation, worldly policy will urge an outward compliance with the laws of the land for the sake of peace and harmony. And there are some who will even urge such a course from the scripture. Notice what she's saying. There are some who will even urge such a course from the scriptures. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. The powers that be are ordained of God. Notice what she's saying. And she goes on to say, But what has been the course of God's servants in ages past? When the disciples preached Christ and Him crucified after His resurrection, the authorities, the professed church, commanded them not to speak anymore nor to teach in the name of Jesus. Notice she's referring to this, this, this verse, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, the powers that be are ordained of God, in reference to not secular power, but in reference to the church, the apostate or the professed church, that existed in the time of the apostles. She's using this uh, Romans 13 to identify the church as the higher power. Notice. I'm going to read this again. There are some who will even urge such a course from the scriptures. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. The powers that be are ordained of God. But what has been the course of God's servants in ages past. When the disciples preached Christ and him crucified after his resurrections. The authorities, which were the professed church, commanded them not to speak anymore, nor to teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than God, ye judge. What were the apostles saying? There's a higher power. The highest power is in heaven. But the, high, the, 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 the higher powers that they were saying they needed to obey, they were saying they needed to obey the authority of the church. So Peter and John answered them and said, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you, or the more unto you more than unto God ye judge, for we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. They continued to preach the good news of salvation through Christ, and the power of God witnessed to the message. The sick were healed. Thousands were added to the church. Then the high priest rose up, and all they that were with him, which is the sect of the Sadducees, and were filled with indignation, and laid their hands on the apostles, and put them in the common prison. Who were the higher powers? Rome? Now, to a certain degree now, right? Realistically, on earth, Right? The church could not do nothing without bringing it to... Well, they could, they could do some things, but they couldn't, uh, they couldn't uh, execute anyone. Right? But notice she was referring to the church, though. So who were the higher powers? Was it Rome? No. It was the professed church. Notice that at the time of the apostles, there was an image of the beast formed. There was an image of the beast formed at the time of the apostles. The powers that be were the high priests and the Sadducees, along with some or many Pharisees. Their power was united with the state. So in that sense, you know, it was, there, there was, you can include the secular powers, but their power was united with the state, and it was, it was when Israel joined Rome that Christ and his followers were able to be put to death. But who was the one initiating or promoting it? It was the church, the professed church. The church did not have the power to do so until she joined herself to the state. The same thing will happen in our day. You see? Testimonies, Volume 5, page 713, paragraph 2 says, But the God of heaven, the mighty ruler of the universe, took this matter into his own hands. For men were warring against his work. He showed them plainly that there is a ruler above man, 
Who's that? The higher powers. Whose authority must be respected. The Lord sent his angel by night to open the prison doors. And he brought forth these men whom God had commissioned to do his work. The rulers said, Speak not at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. But the heavenly messengers sent by God said, Go, stand and speak in the temple to the people all the words of this life. So here we see who were really the higher powers. The higher powers in reality, the highest powers, is God. We've always put God above anyone. The apostles did the same thing. Sister White is showing here also that the higher power is God. There's levels of higher power. You get what I'm saying? On earth, the church is supposed to be the higher power. The true church of God is the higher power that God's people are supposed to be subject to as she leads the people into truth because she's been led by the Holy Spirit. You see, the Holy Spirit works through men for men. So the highest power is God through the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit has men that God has ordained ordained that are their that are ministers the president is not god's minister prime rulers uh, prime ministers are not god's ministers even though they they take that term prime minister they're not they're not ministers of god you go back and look a, and do a whole word search on the word minister and ministers in the bible and it only applies to god's priests never to, to a secular power although they want us to believe that they're the ministers. That's why they entitle themselves prime ministers. You see, it's a deception. They want us to believe that they are the ministers of God, but they're not. We do obey the laws of the land because we're good citizens. But we only have we have one true law that supersedes every law, and that is the law of God. He is the higher power. Jesus Christ is the higher power. The church is the higher power. God's ministers who are also representing the church are the higher powers. But they don't really have any power within and of themselves. It is the power of God. It is the Holy Spirit that leads and is manifested through His people. So you see, men may have been permitted to lord power over us temporarily. But there's only one true lord and higher power. His power supersedes any earthly, secular, man-made power. Man-made power is not a power ordained of God. Man-made powers are actually produced or birthed through satanic influences. Because even to have a king is a satanic um, movement that's why the children of Israel only had one king and that was Jesus Christ but they wanted to be like all the other nations you see so any earthly power that rules over and takes advantage of is that has nothing to do with God not not at all God does not ordain that that is not God's minister all right Jesus is, 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 is the executive branch. His ministers, his priests, his ministers are the, the higher powers that he works through. He works through them. He manifests his higher power through them because they carry the word. And it's the word that is the higher power. All right, now, enough of that. Let's continue now. First Timothy chapter 6, verse 13 to 15. Paul gives us a precious, a precious charge. He says, I give thee charge in the sight of God, who quickeneth all things, and before Christ Jesus, who before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good confession. So what is this charge? That thou keep the commandments without spot, unrebukable, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Which in his times he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords. It's only one. It's only one higher power, Jesus Christ. So what's the charge, brethren? The charge is to keep the commandments of God perfectly. But how can we do that? How is it possible that wretched 
a wretched man like me, a wretched man, man like us, people like us, human beings, born in sin, sin shaped, shaped in iniquity, how can we keep the commandments of God perfectly? Is it even possible? Yes, it is. How? By allowing God to write His law of love upon our hearts. That's how it's possible. This is not the time, brethren, to exercise continued resistance towards God. It is a time to become God's loyal subjects. Times are getting serious, and they're only going to get seri more serious and more serious and more serious, brethren. We're going to hear all kind of false things from ministers all over, from the pulpits all over the, all over the world, telling us we need to obey the laws of the land. And yes, we do, until they conflict with the laws of God. But they're going to say, no, but they're the higher powers. So God ordained them. And that, that means we should obey them, and by obeying whatever they say, we're obeying God. That's heresy. That is not biblical. Testimony, Volume 5, page 713, Paragraph 3. Those who seek to compel men to observe an institution of the papacy and trample upon God's authority are doing a work similar to that of the Jewish leaders in the days of the apostles. When the laws of earthly rulers are brought into opposition to the laws of the supreme ruler, the higher power of the universe, then those who are God's loyal subjects will be true to Him. Praise the Lord. Review and Herald, January 1st, 1889, paragraph 4. Let not the commandment-keeping people of God be silent at this time, as though we gracefully accepted the situation. There is the prospect before us of waging a continuous war at the risk of imprisonment, of losing property and even life itself to defend the law of God, which is being made void by the laws of men. This Bible text will be quoted to us. Notice what she says again. This Bible text will be quoted to us. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. The powers that be are ordained of God. She's warning us, brethren. Inspiration is warning us. God is warning us through inspiration that we're going to hear these things from the pulpits of churches. Some of our own ministers are going to say we need to obey these laws because they are ordained of God. These powers are ordained of God. Be not deceived, brethren. Evil power is never ordained of God. I'm going to say that again. Evil power. Now, do we see any righteous powers in this earth? Any of these prime ministers or presidents or kings, queens, dictators? Are they righteous powers? Or are they evil powers? Let's not be deceived. Evil power is not and never will be ordained of God. God only ordains righteous power. Because it's His power. It's His power. None of us are righteous. It's Christ who's righteous. But those that are in Christ and Christ be in them, He exercises His righteous power through them, through His vessels. So only righteous power is ordained of God. Christ is that power. And He exercises and manifests that power through those that abide in Him. This means that we should be subjecting ourselves to God's true church and His true ministers, those that stand upon the Word of God. And we don't mean, uh, and I don't take this wrong, I'm not saying we should subject ourselves uh, like, like, you know, just blindly follow whatever. No, no, no. It means that we, 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 we need to know what gospel order is. And we should have a high regard for those that God has anointed and that He's using to bring as vessels to bring us truth. That's what it means. To be, to be subject to, uh, to His ministers. You know what I'm saying? To be uh, subject to His church. Many people say, no, well, we're going to be subject to this church because it calls itself the remnant church of God, even though... It might be an apostasy. Or many leaders and many uh, ministers are in apostasy. So, but let's just, let us just be subject to that church because that is the ship. And when that ship, that, if they, and we don't want to get off that ship because if we get off that ship, you know, uh, we're, we're going to die. You see, they're going to also use that same tactic. But what is the church, brethren? 
The church are those who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ and have the faith of Jesus Christ. The church is not, and we saw that last week too. Last week we saw that the church, we saw the true identity of the church. What is the church? It's, it's actually an invisible entity today. The church is not a visible church today. If you go back and study prophecy, as I said, study the watches. If you study these type of things, you will see the church of today is not any visible mainstream denominational church. It is an invisible church. It is those who are actually converted and committed to the work and cause of God. So what is the ship? The ship is Jesus Christ. When Noah and his family got into the ark, they were safe because that ark represented Jesus Christ. Anyone who is in Christ is the church. So there are many who have never had an opportunity, brethren, to hear these types of special truths that God is giving to us for this time. The obligation of the fourth commandment has never been set before them in its true light. He who reads every heart and tries every motive will leave none who desire a knowledge of the truth to be deceived as to the issues of the controversy. The decree is not to be urged upon the people blindly. Everyone is to have sufficient light. Now this is from Great Controversy 605 paragraph 1. The decree, talking about the National Sunday Law, which is coming soon. The decree is not to be urged upon the people blindly. Everyone is to have sufficient light to make his decision intelligently. Praise the Lord. No one will suffer the wrath of God who doesn't want to suffer the wrath of God. No one. No one is going to be left blind. Everyone will have sufficient light. Everyone. To make his decision intelligently. Praise God. This is why we're told in Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 14. That the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. As the waters cover the sea. Nobody will be left out. Everybody will have the opportunity. To make their decision. Whether they want to get on that ark. Or whether they want to drown. The loud cry of the Lord. Will be heard. And the Lord will say this. In Deuteronomy 30 verse 19. I call heaven and earth. To record this day against you. That I have set before you life and death. Blessing and cursing. Therefore choose life. That both you and thy seed may live. This is the loud cry of the Lord. And it's being heard now, but it will be heard to everyone. Every person will hear that voice. The loud cry will also be heard from God's people. And it's found in Joshua chapter 24, verse 15. Verse 15. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom ye will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served, which were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. God's people will not be moved at that time. The true remnant, those who have been prepared and have been preparing, will not be moved. They will be fixed. And there's a saying that says, judgment starts at the house of God. What does that mean? It means that those that have the truth are right now being prepared or preparing to not be prepared. So when that time comes, it will be very quickly for God's people to be sealed. Because they already had the truths that, was, that were necessary for them to be sealed on one side or the other. In Great Controversy 605 paragraph 2, it says the Sabbath will be the great test. Of loyalty. For it is the point of truth especially controverted. Remember, although this is the case, there's a deeper, more underlying reality that the Sabbath represents the spirit of restfulness. God's people will be developing a level of restfulness that nothing will be able to shake them at that time. But nonetheless, it says, The Sabbath will be the great test of loyalty, for it is the point of truth especially controverted. 
when the final test shall be brought to bear upon men, then the line of distinction will be drawn between those who serve God and those who serve Him not. While the observance of the false Sabbath in compliance with the law of the state Sorry, I'm going to... Uh, I think I skipped the line. Hold on. While the observance of the false Sabbath in compliance with the law of the state, contrary to the fourth commandment, will be an avowal of allegiance to a power. Notice what she says here. Will be an avowal of allegiance to a power. Doesn't say higher power. She calls it a power. Notice what the powers of the land... Uh, the laws of the land are, they are a power, but not the higher power, right? She says, While the observance of the false Sabbath in compliance with the law of the state, contrary to the fourth commandment, will be an avowal of allegiance to a power that is in opposition to God, the keeping of the true Sabbath in obedience to God's law is an evidence of loyalty to the Creator. While one class, by accepting the sign of submission to earthly powers, receive the mark of the beast, the other, choosing the token of allegiance to divine authority, receive the seal of God. Wow. Praise God. You see, brethren, we cannot allow ourselves to be deceived. We have been using Romans chapter 13, verses 1 to 7, out of context. For many, many years. I myself have used it myself. We can use it in a certain context to describe civil law. You know, the laws of the land. We can. We can say, yes, we are subject to the laws. Right? Because they have rule over us temporarily here on earth. And they're good laws. Like, not stealing. Those are good laws. There's some good laws in the law books. There's a lot of bad laws. But there's a lot of good laws that actually line up with God's laws. Like, you know, thou shalt not kill, right? That's a good law. You know, if you go and commit murder, you're going to go to prison. But the real context, the real truth about the higher powers are not these lower earthly powers. It is Jesus Christ. It is His Word that trickles down through His church and through His ministers. The final test is soon to come upon this world, brethren. The line of distinction will be drawn. God is asking us today for us to think about this question. As we think and contemplate and we're seeing the signs of the times closing in, the question that we need to ask ourselves is, which side will we be on? Because it's totally up to us. This, the answer to this question could be found in the manner of life that we are living in now. The way we're living right now could be an indicator that gives us the answer to this question. Are we still clinging on to cherished sin and defects of character? Or are we overcoming the hurdles of sin and allowing God to polish away every stain from our characters? This is what we need to contemplate this evening. Because these are the indicators of where we are headed. You know, I give out an op a, a, a petition to every soul that's within the hearing of my voice. You know, Jesus Christ he became us so that He can live a perfect life for us. So that when the Father sees us, they don't see us. He doesn't see us. He sees the Son. That means, brethren, we will not... You see, our sins have been paid for already. If we think that we're not good enough or, you know, we've done too many evils, you know, every sin that we have committed or will commit has already been paid for and died for at Calvary in other words we've been redeemed brethren every soul has been redeemed and God has forgiven us in Christ 
The question is, will we forgive ourselves? That's the question. Will we receive the forgiveness that has been wrought out for us by Jesus Christ? The evidence that we receive that forgiveness and accept it will be seen in our life, will be seen in, in the things that we do, in the way we change for the better. Because God is preparing a people to live in an environment where sin does not exist. To live in a place where sin does not exist, we need to start being cleansed from sin now. Because sin was already paid for. But the problem is that we're clinging on to these things and we're we're not receiving the forgiveness. We're not, we're not benefiting from the forgiveness that God has wrought out. When we receive that forgiveness and we accept that forgiveness, it, it does something to our hearts. It transforms us so that we live in that forgiveness. And the evidence of that life that lives in that forgiveness is that sin does no longer rise up its head. It begins to be uh, 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 a, a, a something that, ha that gets cleansed out of us. Jesus Christ begins to be able to now take those habits of sin out of us. Those tastes that are sinful out of us. Because we give Him the legal authority to do so. May the Lord have mercy, brethren, on each and every one of us. And may each one, within the hearing of this message, take heed to the warnings and, uh, and the admonitions that God has given us today. I'm going to close with a word of prayer and then we'll have a closing song and another closing prayer. We'll take some comments and questions after this prayer if we have any. Dear Heavenly Father, I want to thank you so much for your word. We thank you for showing us what's going to happen in the near future. Showing us the true context of Romans chapter 13 verses 1 to 7 warning us calling us dear Lord we thank you we thank you for Jesus Christ and what he has done for us in forgiving us of our sins help us Lord to receive that forgiveness so that we can have a, that experience of forgiveness and, and forgive ourselves and recognize that you've done everything for us and lived for us the perfect life so that we can be made holy. So dear God, touch every heart, touch every soul that has heard this message. And Lord, as we continue on with these series, learning more and more of what's coming, may we take these times very serious as we recognize the essence of time and how time is of the essence. Help us not waste our time with frivolity and foolishness and things that have no meaning and no purpose and no benefit to our lives. Help us to utilize every moment, every second in training ourselves by allowing your Holy Spirit to take charge of our mind. You said to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. But Lord, the only way we can do that is by surrendering to you. Help us, Lord, that we may all have the desire to surrender everything and the power to do so. So we pray that your Holy Spirit will empower each person with the power to let go of everything that may be holding us back so that we can be polished, made clean, and made precious stones for your building. That we can be part of those 144,000 to give the loud cry. Dear God, we thank you and we praise you. We, for we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen.